Good evening, children. It's Granny Macduff, ready with a story. So make yourselves comfy, and I'll begin. Once upon a time, there lived a king who was quite ill. He knew his time was coming to an end. And so he called for his most trusted servant, Faithful John. But John was not just a servant. He was the king's man, an advisor, a caregiver, a friend. He had been by the king's side his whole life and had always been true to him. My time is short, the king said, and I can leave here in peace except for one thing. My son is still young. He does not yet know so many things, and I will not be able to teach him, to look after him, to guide him. John, I ask you, take him as your own. Love him as a son. Watch over him as you have watched over me. I shall teach him all I know. I shall never leave his side. I will keep him safe, even if it means giving my life for his. This I swear, John replied. And when I am gone, you must show him all the rooms in the castle, the vaults, the treasures, every chamber, the tunnels underneath. Show him all. Except the chamber at the end of the long gallery. You know of which I speak. The one which keeps the portrait of the princess of the golden dwelling. You shall not show him this. For if he sees that painting, he will fall violently in love with her. And he will put himself and others in great peril. I ask that you keep him from that. The picture will be well concealed. I shall lock the door myself and keep him from it. John assured the king. Now I am at peace. Thank you, my friend. And with that, the king passed away. When the prince was crowned as king, John told him all that he had promised his father, with the exception of the room at the end of the long gallery. I will be faithful to you as I have been to your father. I will protect you without fail, even if it costs me my life. John, you are so dear to me, the young king told him. And so John showed him the castle, every room, every trinket, every treasure, with the exception of one. The picture in the room was hung so that when the door was opened, one would look straight upon it. Everyone who had seen it remarked that it was the most beautiful portrait they had ever seen. So beautiful, in fact, that it seemed to live and breathe before their very eyes. One day, John and the young king passed by the door to the chamber at the end of the long gallery. The king remarked, John, you have shown me every room but one. Why do you pass it by and not show me what is inside? What is in that room will terrify you. It's, it's not for you to look upon. This is my castle, is it not? I will see what this room holds. The king tried to break the door down, but could not. Open the door, John, I command it. Your father made me promise to keep what is inside hidden from you. What is inside could bring great misfortune to you and to others. I must see what is inside, said the young king. I shall not rest until I do. It will destroy me if I do not see it. I shall not leave until you have unlocked it. With that, 
John knew there was no avoiding it. He must open the door. And so, with great hesitation, he took out the keys and opened the door. John went in first and thought if he stood in front of the painting, blocking the king's view, he would not see it. But the king stood on his tiptoes and looked right over John's shoulder. When he saw the portrait, the young king fell so in love that he fainted. John carried him to his bed and sat with him by his side until he woke. And when he did, the first thing that he said was, Oh, what a beautiful portrait. Tell me, John, who is she? She is the princess of the Golden Dwelling. If all the world could tell her how I love her, it would not be enough. My love is so great, I would give my life to win her. John, please help me, you must. My love for her is so great that I will not be able to go on without her. And so, faithful as John was, he agreed and thought very long about how best to go about it. You see, it was hard enough to gain entry into the kingdom of the Golden Dwelling, let alone to set eyes on the princess herself. Finally, he had a plan. He told the king, everything in the palace of the Golden Dwelling is gold. The tables, chairs, bedposts, the bowls in which to keep fruit. In your treasure, you have five tons of gold. Let the goldsmiths work it into sculptures, utensils, hairpins, anything that might please her. And we will bring them with us and try our luck. Let it be done, said the young king. He called every goldsmith in the kingdom to the castle and asked them to make everything as quick as they could. The goldsmiths worked tirelessly. When they had finished, the treasure, now sculpted into the most beautiful wares, was loaded onto a ship. Faithful John put on the clothing of a merchant and told the king to do the same, for he must be unrecognisable. They sailed across the sea, and on they went, until they reached the kingdom of the Golden Dwelling. Stay on the ship, John told the king. I will see if I can persuade the princess to come here to see the wares. Have them on full display. John, taking one small sack of gold trinkets with him, went into the city and found his way into the palace courtyard. There, a young girl stood by a well, drawing water with two golden buckets. When she saw John, she asked, I have not seen you before. Who are you, sir? I am a merchant, John replied. He opened his sack and showed her the golden items inside. <gasps> How beautiful, she exclaimed. After she had examined them, the girl said, The princess must see these. She will most certainly want to buy all you have. Follow me. As it turned out, the young girl was the princess's lady-in-waiting. She led John into the palace and brought him straight to the princess. When she saw what John had brought with him, the princess was delighted. Oh, how lovely they are. I shall buy them all, she said. I am but a faithful servant, my lady. I work for a rich merchant. He has many more pieces on his ship. What I have here is nothing in comparison. He has brought some of the most valuable things that have 
ever been made of gold. The princess was intrigued. Can he not bring them here for me to see? It would take far too long, days, perhaps weeks, and so many rooms would be required to display them. I'm afraid your palace is not big enough. This made the princess even more curious. Take me to the ship. I will meet this merchant and see his treasures. When the princess saw the merchant, who was really the young king, she fell so in love that she too fainted, just as he had done when he looked upon her portrait. The king carried her inside and stayed until she awoke. It is not gold I want, or treasure. Those things seem to matter not at all now. It is only you, she told him. And you are the reason I have come here, princess. Your portrait sits in my castle. And when I saw it, I knew my heart beats only for you. It always has. I just never knew it. Take me with you, for I do not wish to be parted from you from this day forward, said the princess. I am not a merchant, but a king. Will you be my wife, my queen, my life? Yes. And with that, John commanded the crew, Let us fly like a bird in the air. Set the sails and steer us home. That night, aboard the ship, the king and the princess were married. They celebrated and John thought, perhaps the old king was wrong. Perhaps the old king was wrong. Perhaps all will be well. The next morning, John sat on the bow of the ship. A musician played songs on a lute nearby. It was quite peaceful and all seemed well. Suddenly, three ravens flew toward the ship and landed on the yardarm, the timber to which the sail is attached. John listened to what the birds were saying. So, the king has married the princess of the golden dwelling, said the first. Yes, but he has not arrived home yet, replied the second raven. But there it is, the shore on which they land, just off in the distance. Not far, not far at all, the third said. Near or far, it matters not, for when they do reach the shore, there a noble steed awaits the king, and when he mounts the grey horse, it will take off with him. Into the air it will go, with the wings of a bird, and he will never see his fair maiden again, cried the first. Is there no escape? asked the second. Of course, but only if someone gets there before the king, removes its tack and runs it off. But who knows well enough to do that? And even if they did, and they told the king then they would be turned to stone from knee to toe. Ah! Ah! And this much more I know. Even if the horses run off, the king shall still not keep his bride. For when they arrive at the castle, there in his room will a new coat for his wedding celebration await. It is poison itself. And when he puts it on, it shall be the end of him, said the second. Is there no escape? asked the third. Of course, but only if someone with gloves on takes the coat and throws it into the fire. Then the king shall be saved. But who knows well enough to do that? And even if they did, and they told the king, then they would be turned to stone from rib to toe. 
replied the second. And even more do I know. If the garment is burnt, even then the young king will still not keep his bride. For at the celebration, when the bride is dancing, there she will fall as if dead. And if someone does not cut the golden lock of hair with three pins fitted on it, then she will never wake. But who knows well enough to do that? And even if they did, and they told the king, then they would be turned to stone from head to toe. Ah! Ah! said the third. And with that, the three birds flew away. John thought long and hard about all he had heard. If he kept this to himself, it would lead to the king's demise. But if he told him, it would mean sacrificing his own life. He made up his mind. He said to himself, I cannot let the king suffer. I shall save him even if it means my own destruction. When the ship came close to the shore, everyone could see the grey horse standing there. He is magnificent, said the king. He shall carry me to the castle, and you, my queen, shall ride with me. How regal he is, she said. Suddenly, John jumped into the water and swam ashore. There, he untacked the horse and ran it off. The king's men, who were not very fond of John, for he was liked far more than they, cried, Look what he has done! How shameful to run such a beautiful creature off when he could have carried our king to the castle! Leave him alone, said the king. It is always with good intentions that John acts. Who knows what would have happened had he not acted? Let us always trust John, for he is most faithful. When they arrived at the castle, the king went straight for the coat laying in wait on his bed. How beautiful! But John pushed in front of him and with gloves on took the garment and threw it into the fire. The king's men cried, Look what he has done! How shameful to burn such a beautiful garment that our king could have worn for the celebration of his marriage! Leave him be, said the king. It is always with good intentions that John acts. Who knows what would have happened had he not acted? Let us always trust John, for he is most faithful. Later, the wedding celebration had begun. The king and queen had their first dance. It was glorious. But just as the music came to a close, John noticed how pale the queen had become and he made it to her just in time to catch her from falling to the ground. My love! cried the king. It was as if she were dead, but she still had breath in her. John found the lock of hair with the three pins and took out his knife to the horror of everyone around him. And he cut off the lock of hair. The queen immediately opened her eyes. Not understanding John's actions and after what was quite a scene, the king was very upset. Throw him in the dungeon, he ordered. The next morning, John was led in shackles before the king. John looked at the king and said, May I speak? So granted, replied the king. And so John told the young king everything the ravens had said and that his actions had been to keep him and his bride safe from harm. And just as he spoke the last word, John turned to stone. From head to toe. 
Oh, my most faithful John. The king fell at John's feet, but it was no use. He ordered the stone John to be brought to his bedchamber and placed next to his bed where John had always sat and read him stories as a boy. Not a day went by that the king did not sit by the statue and say, Oh, John, if only I could bring you back to life. Years passed. The king and queen had two children, twin boys, who grew quickly and were the apple of their parents' eyes. One day, while the queen was tending her garden, the king once again said to John's statue, Oh, John, if only I could bring you back to life. And it was this day that the stone spoke. You may bring me back, but not without consequence. For you must sacrifice what is dearest to you. I will give you anything and everything, the king cried. You must leave your family, go into the forest and never return. The king was shocked to hear this. But when he thought of John and how faithful he had been and how he had given his life for him, his resolve was clear. When the queen returned from her garden, he told her what had happened. For his fidelity, we owe it to him, do we not, husband? The king took off his crown and without another word left the castle. He walked deep into the woods where he found a small cabin where no one lived. There he stayed. He made a fire and foraged from the land. When the sun began to rise, there was a knock at the door. The king opened it. And there he stood. It was John. Alive and well. John! He cried. They embraced. You have shown that you too are faithful to me, just as I was to you. And it shall not go unrewarded, my king. With that, John turned, and there, coming towards them, were the king's wife and sons. After much celebration, they went back to the castle and lived in happiness for the rest of their days. The End Hello children, don't forget you can listen to all my stories on YouTube at Granny McDuff. And now it's time to take a deep breath, close our eyes, so that we may drift off into a world of our own adventure. Good night, children. <laughs>